16, and the verses we're particularly looking at is starting with verse 28. Go to verse 30, but actually we're going to read the context. We'll start with verse 18 to remind us, because it's been a few weeks since we've been in this passage. Hear God's word as we look at it together. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that, he became very sorrowful. He said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And then Peter said this, verse 28, see, we have left all and followed you. And so he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is not one who has left house or parents or brothers or sisters or children for the sake of the gospel of God who shall not receive many times more in the present time and in the age to come eternal life. May God, uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are very much like Peter. We like weighing the benefits of what we do, the investments we make, the schooling we, we go through, the jobs we take. And there are going to be times that we will ask the question, is it worth it to follow Christ? To believe him, to, to run from sin, which dishonors God. That, that's all a part of following him. And, and while there is a way that seems right to to man, but, the end, but its end is the way of death, our eyes far too often are drawn to look at other people and compare our lives with them, and particularly people that, that are living worldly, that, that seem to do good for now, despite what Romans 6 tells us, that there'll be shame and death which comes from that. And we can struggle with self-pity, like the psalmist Asaph, which we read earlier saying, surely I have kept my heart in vain. Is it worth it to do the right thing when no one else does? When it makes you unpopular at school or with your friends? When it might cost you some business or profit? When it takes time? Particularly Sunday mornings when, when others do what they want, including sleeping in. Is it worth it? When it means maybe a relationship. Not just uh, dating for marriage, but even the relationships in our, our general life. When we sometimes have to give those up because it's hindering our godly growth, it's, it's having an, a, a bad influence on us. We're, we're sitting with scoffers, as Psalm 1 says. And it's keeping us from following Christ. And what makes it even more difficult to follow the Lord is that many who name the name of Christ do not depart from iniquity, and we struggle with that too. Is it worth it? Follow Christ when it seems that sinners have all the fun. Particularly when what God wants for us is not the same as what we want for ourselves. This is not a new struggle. We're seeing it here in the text. And it's why elsewhere even Jesus says in Luke 14, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
We don't put him first. And to help us understand this, we're going to look this morning at first how we must forsake everything to follow Christ. And lastly, we keep our eyes on Christ who graciously promises to bless us for time and eternity. Remember the rich young ruler again. He had just pridefully declared that, that he thought he had obeyed all of God's commands. But then Jesus told him, okay, I'll give you one more command. Sell everything you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And we know, as we just read too again, that the young man responded by walking away. And Jesus was sad about this. But knowing all things, he was not surprised. Because what he had done is he had revealed the rich young ruler's heart, how he broke the first and last commandment, and really everything in between. And that's why Jesus said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. If our priority is, is the things of this world, it's going to cloud our vision of the things of God, at the very least. And here's this man, one they probably thought that they would all vote on as the most likely to go to heaven. And now they hear this from Christ. And I think Peter was maybe a little bit concerned, but we know too, really, he's, he's speaking for all of the disciples. And he says, see, we have left all to follow you. In fact, in the par one of the parallel texts of this too, in Matthew, it says, what shall we have? What do we get out of this? What's the cost-benefit bar? Is following you worth it? And this brings us to our first point for the study, and that is to follow Christ, we forsake, we must forsake everything for him. The disciples had done which, what the rich man had refused to do. They had left their jobs. They had left their fishing nets. You remember when Christ first called them. They had left their families to follow Jesus. And now they were thinking hard about their own salvation. They were still learning about who Christ is and what he was yet to do and what it meant to follow him. But even as we think of that, understand the Lord's mercy here because they still were looking at a one-to-one -one equation. They had given up these things. They, they deserve salvation. Well, no. Because salvation is by grace through faith. And following Jesus is far more than just giving up some material things. We come to Jesus trusting for our salvation and in repentance and faith. And to repent is, is to turn more and more from our sin. It's, it's to wrestle with our sin. It's not to live comfortably with our sin. And it's to leave old sins and worldly habits behind more and more. Sometimes that can include the fact or the reality that we have made material things our idol. Because we get security in those things. But Jesus told the rich young ruler, sell it. Sometimes we see security in the relationships of those close relationships we have. Which is why Jesus warns us, because sometimes we can put those things before the Lord. And so Jesus tells us, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, Jesus' point about giving it up, giving up everything, and the disciples saying they gave up everything, is that the priority has to be following the triune God. And if something in our life becomes the God of our life, The Lord will oftentimes make us let go of it. And it's hard. Because we live in a society that we sit there and we don't have the idols like they used to years ago. And yet we are a society filled with idols. The stuff we accumulate. And the reality is God, and, and there's multiple things, but God will not allow us to have any gods before him. But understand, there's more sins than just materialism. 
Galatians 5 shows that. There's sexual immorality, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all those things Paul writes. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of, of God. See, we're called to make our priority not our own self-pleasure, not what makes us feel secure, not what makes us feel good in ourselves, but we're called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that be, the means being committed to follow our triune God, no matter what the trials are, he sovereignly brings into our life. We have to follow him, not just on the good days, but the bad days too. And you know what? The Lord, just like that rich young ruler, is going to make each of us give up different so that he would have first place in our hearts and our lives. And we have to wrestle honestly with the Lord about these things, in prayer and by his word. But overall, we must walk daily in fellowship with a gracious Savior who loved you and me and gave himself for us, to forgive us. We have to trust that promise. See, that's why our, ultimately our focus really isn't on just, just what we give up. It has to be on our Savior. And sometimes our focus gets kind of skewed that way, doesn't it, at times? This brings us to the second point. We must keep our eyes on Christ, who graciously promises to bless us for time and eternity. You know, Jesus, again, was so gracious in his response to Peter. He's not saying we earn something, because we are saved by grace through faith him as our righteousness and even that faith as a gift from God but to encourage our weakness this is this is why Jesus gave this answer because when we, we when we follow him we will have we will be weak we'll be wondering whether it's worth it we'll be struggling with a mocking of the word we'll be struggling with a loss of friends or family or a job asking is it worth it to lose your life even to follow Christ and we understand, probably for the vast majority of Christians, that really is their main concern. Am I going to lose my life for going to church, for worshiping the Lord, for being a Christian? Or to help the disciples, even us today, to understand the benefit-cost ratio, Jesus says in verse 29 through 30, Assuredly I say to you, he's giving a sure promise. This is not just the disciples. This is all who, who believe in him through the ages. There is no one who has left house, parents, or brothers, or wife, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. It's not for being rude. It's not for being a jerk. But it's for serving the Lord. And Jesus continues, who shall not receive many times, many times more in this present time and in the age to come in eternal life. And we follow Christ not because we think that he is that great vending machine in the sky. And you put a little bit in, you get a little bit out. We follow Christ because he is the Lord and Savior. And the scripture tells us, too, there's salvation in no one else. And that should be enough reason to follow him. It should be enough reason for us to do, as Hebrews said of Joseph, that, that he considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth of the treasures of Egypt. He considered Christ's salvation more important than something that, that's going to pass through our hands anyway. And we need to realize the same thing. The salvation of Christ far outweighs the passing riches of dust of this world around us. The Danish Christian philosopher Kierkegaard said, anyone redeemed by Christ should be so grateful for their salvation that he will not give any consideration to other compensations. And there is some truth to that. But notice how gracious and generous Christ is. The one who changed gallons of water. Not just making one bottle, but changed gallons of water into the best wine. The one who is abundant blessing miraculously didn't just feed the, 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 the 5,000. No, there were 12 basketfuls of food left over. 
And what Christ is showing us is that no man or woman or child serves the Lord without some gracious, incredible blessing in the end. See, God will not be any man's debtor. And even if a cup of water, you think about that, the simplest thing, we talked a little bit about that last week too, but even a cup of water given in his name will richly be rewarded and repaid. And if that's true of something so simple, then, then how much more will other great sacrifices for Christ and the gospel be repaid even more richly? I know we don't like thinking of, of rewards. They're, they're not really rewards. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. It'll, it'll be a blessing far beyond measure, and it's a blessing of grace. But the Bible talks about those things at times, and we've got to understand that in the context. It talks about building on, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and some uh, build with you know, straw and stubble, and that's going to be burned up. But others build on it with precious stones. In other words, giving themselves for the Lord and serving Him. And the Lord will bless that. It's the same thing that, was it, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about us being judged by our works. That's not talking about our salvation. It's talking about a blessing for service to Him. Amen. If we don't serve the Lord for that purpose, but it's given to us as an encouragement. Because let's face it, we struggle with doubts, we struggle with fears, we struggle with regrets, but no one, not you, not me, even those who face intense sorrows in this life, will ever end up on the losing end of God's bargain. For he promises a double blessing in the present and in the age, or in the age to come, eternal life. I know we often think of, uh, of long-term investments. And again, that, that's why we pick the degrees, maybe, and or, or pick the, the career paths that we do in, in school and in college, the studies we endure, the jobs we take, the investments we make. But Jesus is telling us following him is the best short-term and the best long-term investment we can make. Jesus says he will give many times more than what we've sacrificed for him, than what we've given up. The Apostle Paul would learn this lesson. We forget about this because, and again, we've had many freedoms in this country, including religious freedoms. But the reality is, in the ancient world, when somebody became a Christian, when somebody became a Christian from the Jews in particular, they literally would have a funeral for that person. They would be dead to their family. We see that today, too, in a variety of cultures, too. Islam, and Buddhism, and Hinduism. But Jesus' point here is when we are brought to faith, we receive more than we can imagine because and, and one of the things, because you think about it, and I'm going to deal with it directly because he talks about giving up houses and, and family and things like that. But when we're brought to faith, we receive more than we could imagine because we become part of the family of God. And so even if, we, if our family rejects us because of following Christ, we have a perfect heavenly father, a perfect husband, Christ, and all the children of God are our brothers and sisters. It was interesting. I, I first learned this as a young child. I'm about 12 years old, so I should say. In a really pronounced way. When we moved to Brussels. We were away from home. We were in a foreign land. But right away in the church, what happened? We were welcome. We were at home. We were
those blessings are grace, grace related. They're not something we've earned. And while some think, well, you know, we really shouldn't think about heaven, you know, you can, uh, that stupid statement, you can be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, that's baloney. Those who have done the most have their eyes set on heaven the most. And for the one who repents and believes in Jesus Christ, the duration of the life to come is eternal. The blessings far outweigh this veil of tears. And while Jesus says elsewhere that those who, who did not serve him will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, that means it will be proved and more than worth it to follow Christ. Because you and I will be blessed beyond measure. We will enjoy eternal dividends, praising his grace. We're going to have a life of endless days. There will be a life free from uh, relationship struggles. We'll be praising him forever. We'll be, have a more joyful worship than we ever had in this life. We'll have a life with Christ where he personally will wipe away the very last tear that we will ever shed. That's what Christ has promised for you and I, for following him. A beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, a pioneering missionary in India, Elizabeth Freeman, served under very difficult and harsh conditions. And she wrote to her niece back home, I hope you will be a missionary wherever your lot is cast. And as long as God spares your life, for it makes but little difference. After all, where we spend these few fleeting years, if they are only spent for the glory of God. Be assured, there's nothing else worth living for. Nothing else worth living for. Interesting enough, shortly after that note, she was killed by Muslim attackers soon after that. It's easy to wonder, is it worth it? Is it worth it to follow Christ? To not merely be, be ready to sacrifice, because that's not what this is saying. But it is to sacrifice anything that gets in the way, that stands between us and following Christ, because it is worth it. For Jesus promises untold blessings, they're gracious blessings, and they're for an eternity. And a blessed eternity will prove that nothing is more worth living for, nothing or no one is more worth dying for than Jesus Christ and his gospel. May we always look at our life today in light of Christ and a life to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you not only for your undeserved redeeming grace. You've heaped on that still. Promises of your blessing in this life and that which is to come. Drive these words into our heart. Help those who have been fainting. May these promises encourage those who have been questioning the benefit of following you. Lord, too, we pray, open our eyes to be amazed and motivated by your promise of gracious blessings, the reward of your grace, both in this life and even greater in the life to come. Help us to live our lives following after you hard, sacrificing whatever you call us to. Help us to do it eagerly in light of those blessings, but in, most of all, in light of your grace. Strengthen that grace in us. So that we're not just hearers of this word, but so that we will obey it.
as he sends us out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings